Ishmael Reed here today, one of my favorite living writers. I think that uh, the problem confronting uh, black, uh, Hispanic, Native American, other writers is that you uh, are put in a position where you have to audition to be a token. And being a token uh, means that you serve as a proxy for a constituency, okay? So I'm writing a, a piece about James Baldwin, who was a token, but he was a great writer at the same time. So once in a while, the token is a great writer. But we could say that uh, tokenism sort of begins with the abolitionist movement and the token has to compete with another token or two or three tokens in order to be accepted. So right now I'm reading about William Wells Brown, who was uh, one of the first uh, black writers, wrote a novel called Clotel, or The President's Daughter, in the 1850s, which is about Thomas Jefferson's uh, carrying on with uh, Sarah, uh, Sally Hemmings. <coughs> Back there, so like a satire. He wrote satires. Escape or Leap to Freedom is another one of his works. But he had to compete with uh, Frederick Douglass to be accepted by the constituency then, which was run by William Lloyd Garrison of the abolitionist movement. <clears throat> they got upset with Frederick Douglass because he struck out to become independent. In other words, he began his own newspaper, which was competitive. With, uh, the Lib with the Liberator, which was William Lloyd Garrison's newspaper. So even then, uh, there was competition between tokens. So uh, this is a question. There are a lot of excellent writers around. Why is one more prominent than the other, okay? For example, uh, when James Baldwin was writing, there were great writers around, Gwendolyn Brooks, uh, John A. Williams, uh, John O'Killens, uh, why Baldwin, okay? Well, Baldwin, and I say again, he's a great writer. Baldwin became the darling of Richard Wright's enemies. So literary scholars take that feud between James Baldwin and Richard Wright in a superficial manner and subjected only to literary analysis when there are forces behind that. For example, everybody's protest novel was published in France first, but then it was published by the Protestant Review. William Phillips of the Protestant Review belonged to the John Reed Club in New York, it's the Communist Party, Richard Wright belonged to the John Reed Club in Chicago, okay? There's always a rivalry between the worker writers of Chicago and the esthetes and bohemians of New York, all right? So by the time that William Phillips met Richard Wright, Richard Wright was withdrawing from the Communist Party because he felt that they wouldn't permit him to become an independent writer. So he is becoming disillusion, the comrades are calling him a bourgeois decadent, which I guess is the worst thing you could be. I guess maybe he had a couple of sips of cognac or something. It doesn't, it doesn't take much. So um, Richard Wright was uh, disillusioned with the Communist Party. William Phillips is persuaded by James Baldwin, who says that Richard Wright's book is full of stereotypes, Native Son, and propaganda, while Baldwin is writing a lot of propaganda himself. And some of the people whom William Phillips and those people admire 
use stereotypes. For, for example, Henry James stereotyped Jews, and uh, so did T.S. Eliot. So they had their own stereotypes. But one man's stereotypes, one man's stereotype is another person's fully realized character. Okay, so it's always political when you're talking about stereotypes. So what happens is, Protestant Review hits Richard Wright through James Baldwin. But you have to look at James Baldwin's position. Is he going to be a shoeshine boy for the rest of his life? Or is he going to wash the dishes and be a waiter for the rest of his life? This is a guy who had chops. He's talented. He's young. The Communist Party picks him up. They support him. And so he does the attack on Richard Wright. Then we find out the Protestant Review is subsidized by the Central Intelligence Agency. All right? Then they take Baldwin and he goes to Paris and he does a hit job on left-wing writers like W. Du Bois, some of the writers from Africa who are having a conference in Paris. So he writes a hit job on this conference in a magazine called Encounter, subsidized by the CIA. So you see, it's not always literature. It's not always, a, 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 you know, on the surface, uh, you know, uh, aesthetics or art. There are always political forces behind these. Central Intelligence, FBI, they love abstract painting. Because they don't have, have anything to do with anything. You know? They're, you know, FBI, uh, Jack Hoover said he loves modernism. <laughs> you know? So the social realists are dumped because they're political. All right? So behind these forces are politics. Now, if we go back earlier, is that better? Yeah. If we go back earlier, take the case of Claude McKay. Claude McKay was picked up by the Liber Liber uh, Liberator magazine, which is run by Max Eastman, who was a socialist. So Claude McKay's task was to uh, jump on the people in Harlem who were saying race first, not class first. We got that, we got that conflict between white left and the black left right now with Bernie Sanders. They say he's not talking about race enough. He believes if you solve all the economic problems, then everybody will act right. And Donald Trump will turn his hotel into a welfare hotel. Well, you know, whatever. You know what I'm saying? This is always a tension. This is always a tension between the black left and the, and the, uh, the white left. That uh, the black left says race is first, Marcus Garvey and all these people. And the white left says no, it's class. So if you listen to KPFA, which I like very much, is class. All the problems of depression in society is, based, is traced to class. This is before gender. Gender comes after that, OK? So uh, they love Claude McKay, you know, West Indian poet, got chops, can write, If We Must Die. It's one of the great poems in the English language, If We Must Die. Uh, his response to the, uh, the riots of 1919, Red Summer where you know, the black middle class fought back and wouldn't take uh, you know, mobs coming into the neighborhoods and lynching people and raping people. Red Summer 1919, If We Must Die. Claude McKay, written in a sonnet form. Written in a sonnet form, using an uh, uh, English form to talk back to power, okay? So, Claude McKay's job was to jump on Marcus Garvey and some of the nationalists in Harlem who were talking about race. But he changes his mind. He thinks he's got a great position here at the Liberator magazine, all right? And he uh, is asked to review a play. He goes to the theater, and he, he says, you know, here I am from Liberator magazine. I want to review this play. I'm assigned to review this play. They make him sit in the balcony. Ah, see? There you go. His colleagues at the Liberator magazine do not sympathize with his plight. You understand? And then he becomes race first. And they, he's turned out. You know, he gets into a big fight with Mike, uh, Mike Gold, who's an excellent writer. Wrote a book called Jews Without Money, a classic. You know, Mike Gold's one of these real proletarian writers. Came in to, to the Liberator Magazine office in dirty clothes, you know, the way he thought that working class people should be, okay? And they got into a big fight, and Liberator Magazine said, well, we have to choose between Mike Gold 
and uh, Claude McKay. So they chose Mike Gold. So Claude McKay is out in the cold and eventually joins the Catholic Church because they sympathize more with his plight than the Communist Party. Okay? And he ends up broke. So that's what happens. And usually the, the patrons go to the right. The patrons go to the right. They start off at the left. And Max Eastman, I guess he's well off because he's got a house in Crogdon Hudson up from New York and he's got a swimming pool. You know, and he doesn't want Claude McKay to come up there because that white people swim in the pool. Yeah, there's that, that, a problem there too. So uh, Claude McKay is ousted, he's broke, and they go get somebody else. That, seems, that, that usually is a fact. Uh, Max Eastman ends up writing for the National Review. You understand? He starts out as a socialist, then he gets over that period, he ends up writing for the National Review, which is a right wing magazine where Irish guys go to learn how to be Anglo. I mean, I hate to put it that way, but I mean, simply, I mean, you know, William Buckley was Irish. He's part Irish, part German. I think his, I think his, his mother, I think his father was Irish, his mother German, something like that. But, you know, here's an Irish guy who wants the Anglos to, to with, observe that he plays Handel on a harpsichord. You know, I mean, people, everybody says, well, Daniel Moynihan. What about Daniel Moynihan? Well, he's trying to be Anglo, too. The, the way, uh, you know, the underclass, Italians, Irish, and others, the way they get their Anglo prophets is jump on black folks. That's Scalia, <laughs> you know? Scalia comes from Sicily. You know, some of the same, some of the same uh, stereotypes by Sicilians are similar to, to the stereotypes by black people here. So Scalia is trying to get an Anglo upgrade by jumping on black folks. That's the way I look at it. So then we come down to uh, the 1930s, 1940s, where, uh, and I wrote a play about this, where uh, black people uh, in, in uh, New York leave the Communist Party in droves. You understand? Because the Soviet Union signs a pact with Nazi Germany. I wrote a play about that called The Final Version. The Final Version, which was done in New York last year. And uh, I go explore what happened there in the 1930s when they made that pact. So that's what Ralph Ellison's novel is all about. If you sort of like decode it, you know, it's a very dense novel and you have to really pay attention. But if he wrote, like Richard Wright, if he wrote something plain, House on American Activities Committee would have to get it. So you have to write, you have to really write in a lot of dense prose. You know, right in the 1960s, people say, you know, screw that, we don't like the way people talk in the streets. But Ralph Ellison had to write a lot of this prose. But his, his problem was that he might have been in the Communist Party. But his problem was that the Communist Party began to devote their interests in saving the Soviet Union. And they abandoned black issues like foreclosure, dispossession, those issues, police brutality. The Communist Party had an alliance with people like Adam Clayton Powell in Harlem over the issues of police brutality, of stores there not hiring local black people and issues like that. But then the idea came to save the Soviet Union. That's going on right now. That's going on right now. You hear the left, they devote all day on the radio and the papers about Gitmo. There's only 100 people at Gitmo. They got a soccer court. They got black people, uh, women, Puerto Rican people, Hispanics. They're being tortured every day in prisons all across the country. You know, I've been to some of these prisons. I mean, you don't have to go all the way to, uh, to Guantanamo Bay to find people being tortured. That was a big scandal in Chicago a few months ago. I mean, it's happening all over. So uh, they're all devoted to, uh, to Gitmo and in the 1930s. Uh, that's what happened where they abandoned the uh, struggle of blacks in Harlem and they devoted their attention to saving the Soviet Union. So that presented a dilemma before both blacks and Jews. That's the, put the Communist Party in New York in disarray, from which they never recovered, because uh, Hitler's uh, Nazi Germany was showing its anti-Semitism in the early 30s. So there were Jews who remained on because they believed that they were against ethnicity, against nationalism, at the rise above ethnicity, but there were some people who abandoned. And my play is about a black writer who uh, who is a writes for a proletarian newspaper like the Liberator, one of those newspapers. But then when one of the Jewish editors leaves and goes uptown to a big publisher, she asks him to follow her. And so he goes uptown with her 
and all his radical past is expunged, which is what happened to Ellison. There's a new, there's a new book called, uh, by Barbara Foley on Ellison's communist past. His, his, that was all erased. When I interviewed him, he didn't even want to talk about that past. But now it's being uncovered that he was really a, a radical left. And then they cleaned him up, Random House cleaned him up, so he became acceptable to the mainstream. So next comes uh, Baldwin. And I told you about Baldwin being used as a hatchet man. He told uh, Julia Wright, Richard Wright's daughter, before he died, that he was being used. He was used. One of his constant companions was a woman named Mary Payne, who was a, a member of the Office of, of Strategic Services, which became the CIA. All right? So there are always political forces behind these things. And there's a new book called FBI's, E-Y-E-S. You see it's being ignored that, that uh, they had all these black writers on the FBI list. So maybe nobody else is reading us, but the FBI was. My only problem is they spelled my name Ismail. Oh. Uh, I said, well, you can get my name right. So I'm one, of those, I'm one of those writers that they wanted to put in custodial detention in case of a national emergency. And I said, you're going to put me in custodial detention, make it the Mayflower Hotel, the presidential suite, 24-hour room service, you know, access to the cars, I mean, the whole that's my kind of custodial detention I want. So uh, that's how it works. So now I think uh, I'm trying to break the mold. I think our generation in the 1960s broke the mold. That's why you hear more about the Harlem Renaissance than you hear about the 60s. I mean, have you noticed that? They loved the Harlem Renaissance because they had a lot of patrons. And they exalted. I just saw the cover of the New Yorker magazine where they had you know, Malcolm X who's dead. They had all these dead people. And they had Zora Neale Hurston picture bigger than all of them, because the next constituents, constituents became the feminist movement, and it, the idea was gender trumps class and race. This is because uh, Shirley Chisholm said she had more problems being a woman than being a black person. So these bourgeois feminists like uh, Gloria Steinem, all they picked up on that, and so Gloria Steinem was the same. Gender is the most restrictive factor in American life. Well, she's a multimillionaire. I see guys sleeping in the street over there, right? And they just cleaned up a big old block where people were sleeping in the, <laughs> occupied the whole block in front of the YMCA where they was living there. So, you know, she's a multimillionaire. One of her patrons is a, a woman in Provincetown who's worth $300 million. So, I mean, you know, so I mean, they, were, they, they ran with that. And let, and let me just back up a little bit. Because I know that everybody gets uh, labeled as a misogynist. I got my share until I read where they call Eva James Baldwin a woman hater. James Baldwin. I mean, Jane, uh, another country could be seen as the first feminist novel, one of the early black feminist novels. Jane, another country where the heroine of the novel is uh, uh, Rufus's sister, Ida. She gets the best speeches, she gets the best line. She says, I'm oppressed by both white men and black men. That's one of her speeches in another country. She's abused by anonymous black guys, like musicians. I mean, she, you know, she, so she has, I mean, after Rufus is killed, uh, commits suicide for consorting with a white woman. I mean, that's that old Confederate you know, <laughs> solution to interracial stuff. He, he, he dies on page 89, and the only interesting character after that is Ida, and she gets great lines there. So why would you call her a woman hater? He also gave a salute to the feminist movement in Go Tell It on the Mountain. Now if you read Go Tell It on the Mountain, Baldwin refers to an independent woman. You know, Royal goes to the movies and he sees this uh, woman who smokes cigarettes and does anything she wants to do, and he admires that. But by, by the time of the cultural gender revolution, which, uh, which uh, followed the others, you know, uh, James Baldwin becomes a woman hater. And in, a, in a review of uh, If Beale Street Could Talk by June Jordan. June Jordan calls him a woman hater. And he, Ralph Ellison is big culture, so everybody gets, everybody gets wiped out. But Harriet Fraud, F-R-A-A-D, I don't know if you read Tikkun. Yeah, I don't know if you, whether you read Tikkun, but it's Rabbi uh, Michael Lerner's magazine. You can get it online. Harriet Fraud 
says that the feminist movement begins as a integrated working class movement, and it got clocked. And she brings up Gloria Steinem's CIA connections. Here, 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 okay. She never denied it. It's in uh, Random House Publisher autobiography of it, and they cut it out. I don't know if you remember the Red Stocking Brigade. Does anybody remember the Red Stocking? It's a feminist movement in the 1960s. They accuse her of that. She's never sufficiently answered that question. But I see it as an old partition. I'm studying, I'm writing a book in Hindi now. I'm studying Hindi. My next novel you know, has Hindi in it, and I'm studying the history of India. And they do that all over the world, partitions. Partitions. The British went to India, divided the Muslims against the Hindi. You know, before that, before that, the Muslims and Hindi worshiped at the same place as the intermarried, you understand? And, so, and a lot of the, uh, some of the Hindi languages in Arabic, or Arabic and Urdu, which is the language of Pakistan. But I mean, they do that all over. Class against class, gender against gender. You know, that's how the empire keeps going. That's how this empire keeps going. So uh, then, now that the feminist movement is on the wane, you know, bourgeois feminist movement is on the wane, and one more thing, I used to write, I was writing for Playboy for the last few years until they changed. Uh, it was Puerto Rican and black transvestites who began the gay movement. They were the ones who fought the cops at Stonewall. Did you all know that? Did you know those black working class people who fought the police down there at that Greenwich Village uh, bar and started the gay, the gay movement? Did you know that it was lesbians, black lesbians and transvestites transvestites who fought the San Francisco police in the 1970s in, in, a, rest, in a cafe or a after hours place where they go eat, they fought this, they're the ones. But just like the feminist movement, they don't get credit. Uh, middle class people come along and co-op. So now that the uh, feminist movement is on the wane because of its contradictions, and Maureen Dow, I don't usually read her, but she said it began when they backed uh, President Clinton when they backed President Clinton after Monica Lewinsky. They didn't identify with Monica Lewinsky. They identified with Gloria Steinem all of them, with President Clinton. So there are other contradictions that's bringing the movement down. So now we have the new token. The new token, the new black token. Okay, you see his name everywhere, it's all okay. If you wanna know who the tokens on the left are, go to KBLA and listen to Amy Goodman show. If you want to know the tokens on the right, you look John McWhorter, okay? So what happened was, in the 1970s, William Simon, the former Secretary of the Treasury, said, we got to stop all this. The socialists are con controlling the discourse in the United States, on campuses and everywhere. He went out and got a whole lot of rich people, Fortune 500 people. They started their own token system. So John McWhorter is their token. He's a, he's a fellow at the Manhattan Institute, and you see him all over. He came out of nowhere. They moved him ahead of all the people who had paid their dues, got their hand with him in the civil rights movement. They moved him right up front because the people who support the Manhattan Institute are people like Chase Manhattan Bank. They got bucks, and they can get him any, any kind of a, a thing, you know, any kind of uh, publicity that they desire. I debated him you know, uh, on the radio, and he was coming on with his Victorian style. Victor the old, old-timey Victorian style that he has. And he told me I should be more civil uh, toward him. And I said, well, I don't have to be uh, sympathized or be civil toward a Nazi. I call him a Nazi sympathizer because the Manhattan Institute is into eugenics, okay? These are people who believe in the intellectual inferiority of black people. So he's, you know, I guess you have to work somewhere. He could be working at Berkeley for less money. So I guess he took that job. So now the new token is, is called the same, the, the new token is called the successor to James Baldwin. Okay, the successor to James Baldwin. So the people who sponsor these people, there's no ranking. There's no ranking. This kid is 40 years old. They're using him. He's 40 years old. By the same time that James Baldwin was 40 years old, he had produced two masterpieces in a play. He had produced Fire Next Time, which is not written for us. It wasn't written for his nephew. It was too sophisticated language for his nephew. 
uses his nephew as a prop. He wants to get that liberal audience to buy his books. Okay, so at the end, he says, we must save everybody. And the civil rights saved, movement saved everybody. It saved Jewish people, the, the, the Fair Housing Act, 1968, no more racial covenants. Asian American people were able to move out of the ghettos like Chinatown, right? Hispanic people moved up, they had, the civil rights saved everybody. And some people, they, somebody, some people using the feminist, uh, the black uh, uh, power rhetoric, they moved ahead of them. They moved even ahead of black folks. They moved even ahead of them, using tactics created by black people, okay? They moved ahead of them. So I, I listened to the libertarians, and they said, well, we think gay rights is wonderful. And then they said, but we don't believe in a welfare state, wink, okay? Because, you know, stereotype is that black people are on welfare state, okay? So now we have a new token. James Baldwin had two masterpieces out by the time he was 40. Before they replaced, before they, when, they, when James Baldwin was down and had to end up with a teaching job like me, after all this money they gave him, you know, they compared him with Elgin Cleaver. Okay, they replaced him with Elgin Cleaver. They wanted to go from white, from white wine to Jack Daniels. <laughs> you know, they wanted to go from Baldwin to Elgin Cleaver. Cleaver only had one book out. So there's no, there's no differentiation according to time when they choose a token. So, so I've been talking and, and I've been observing this and <clears throat> I was educated by writers of a, of a former generation because I was living in Buffalo, New York and I said, I'm not getting published here. I'm 22 years old. I said, maybe I should go to New York. I mean, you do, you're 22, you do anything. You do foolish things. So I went to New York and I was right. I got published, but I observed the, I observed what happened to other writers who were just as, who wrote just as well as Baldwin and some of the others. What happened to them? John A. Williams died four months ago or so. You don't hear about him, you know why? John A. Williams punctured the myth of the great generation. He said, all your stuff about World War II, the great, it's a lie. Because black troops were segregated in the armed forces, okay? In the Italian campaign, they were, they were, they were uh, commanded by Southern officers because they figured the Southern officers knew how to handle black folk. They'd go to the front without ammunition. They were massacred, okay? There were, there were, there were shootouts between the white GIs and the black GIs. I didn't know that. I, you know, I was a victim of an American education, colonial school, where they taught us to be good natives. And if we behave, we could become like uh, Winston Churchill or somebody, or Basil Rathbone, or somebody like that. I didn't know any of these things. So James Baldwin told me something I knew already. I know it's hard to be black. I mean, but that, I was his uh, audience, although he wrote very well. John A. Williams and, and uh, John O'Killens, who were in the armed forces, they told me something I didn't know, okay? I didn't know about this history of World War II and segregation. I didn't know until maybe within the last 10 years that there were more pro-Japanese fronts among blacks than communist fronts. Did you all know that? That there was a pro-Japanese movement among African Americans in World War II. As a matter of fact, J. Edgar Hoover wanted to bust all the black newspapers for sedition because they were too pro-Japanese, okay? And, and, and uh, two Japanese agents came, collaborated with Elijah Muhammad. Elijah Muhammad was arrested my new book, selling very well in Canada. There's not there's silence. You know, you don't see it in the Chronicle. <laughs> you don't see the truth. But you know, Elijah Muhammad was going around the country making pro-Japanese speeches. Okay, I didn't know any of this. I didn't know because he said that he could not fight the Asiatic black man. And when I went to Japan a, a few years ago, I was told that uh, those eight, one of those agents is still alive. So I didn't know any of these things. So that's why, you know, that's why you hear more about the tokens than you hear about, say, John O'Killens and Johnny Williams, who wrote The Man Who Cried I Am about the persecution of black writers by the FBI. And everybody said, he's crazy. And the King Alfred plan about rounding up black writers in case of a national emergency. And uh, Maxwell has done the research to find that this was true, that such a plan existed. Now this is the irony. 
Ralph Ellison pulled a knife on Chester Himes. Chester Himes was feuding, but all, they all feuding with each other, but the FBI was watching all of them. No matter what position they were in, the FBI had 100 pages on Baldwin, had pages on Richard Wright. They were, they were watching everybody. And they said, well, nobody's reading Black Lives They were. The FBI was reading. And they'd even, they even put up some of uh, the FBI even organized black poetry. They had some of the agents writing black poetry. I bet you journal black poetry was the FBI. I, I, I hate to say this, but I think that I got my most, my most vicious attack from the journal of black poetry. And I said, wow. And the guy who ran it, he never wrote anything after that. I mean, it's, it's true. It's true. Donald Trump said, it's true. It's, you know, that happened. So, I, you know, so I mean, John A. Williams was writing about that in the 1960s. And that's why you don't hear about him. That's why you don't hear about him. Okay, now what is the answer? My solution has become to become a world writer. A world writer. This began when I studied Japanese. I wrote a novel called Japanese by Spring. They hated the book here. They loved it in Japan. You know, I have to please these people. I mean, I love it. They, I had a tour of Japan, treated very well. You know, I signed my, my name in the wrong script. I should have, you know, but I mean, you try. People, people really admire you when at least you try. I studied Yoruba, I went to Nigeria, I was able to talk about it, wrote poetry in, Yor in Yoruba. You know, in May, I go to Italy and I get a, a, a prize for poetry and, and, and music. The Alberto Dubio Award in Italy, I go there. They pay them all the way, I go to Rome. That's the way to do it. With smartphones, with uh, e-books, with uh, more players, you can get a worldwide audience now. You don't have to depend upon the constituency that writers in the past have depended upon. Because in order to enter the mainstream, you had to write for a particular audience. Now I'm reading Giovanni's Room. Now you know, Baldwin is a great writer. Let me tell you something. There's, there are very few writers who are as meticulous in his character descriptions. And it occurred to me that the reason for that is that one of his mentors was Buford Delaney, a painter. But if you look at some of those scenes in Baldwin's works, it's uncanny the way he's able to do characterizations. I mean, if you want to become a writer, look at the way Baldwin handles dialogue, the way he handles dialogue, descriptions, scenes, great panoramic scenes and descriptions, and the subtlety, subtlety with which he does that. But the storyline is not what I consider a great storyline. You understand what I mean? In another country. Go Tell in the Mountain is a great book because he was a star, but he's broke when he wrote it. I'm not saying you have to be broke. It helps. But when the copies of Go Tell in the Mountain arrived in Paris, he's broke, he's starving. When he did another country, he's going for the market. The, the, uh, the lead character is sort of like a white savior figure, Babaldo. Here's Rufus, who's a beast. Beats up his girlfriend, you know, just batters people and abuses his friends and finally jumps off a bridge. But Vivaldo, who's Italian-Irish, tries to save everybody, intervenes, He's like Steven Spielberg. He saw like a Steven Spielberg figure. You understand? Because when he said, when he read The Color Purple, he said all I could do, all I could think about was rescuing Celia. I said, well, why don't you rescue Naomi and Rachel? They beating up Jewish women here, and they beating them up in Israel. I went to Israel. It was such a, it was such, it's such a, 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 a issue over there that when I was in Israel in 2000, the feminists protested the Knesset. So this magazine, the Tablet, asked me to write a piece about Alice Walker uh, boycotting Israel. I said, Well, I'm not going to do that. I said, Why don't you guys get Steven Spielberg to write do a color purple, a Jewish color purple? But I had read in the tablet that Jewish women were complaining that the Jewish producers in Hollywood were giving all their roles to Gentile women. So I said, if you did one, who would play Celie? Nicole Kidman? Or, you know, one of these rhyme maidens in Woody Allen movie. You see, you ever see the Woody Allen movie? They were complaining about that. 
So they, re they rejected it. They, the article, I said the men liked it, but the women didn't like it. You know. So the white savior is Rivaldo, and he gets some of the best lines. And he's such a great guy that when Ida tells him that she stuck with this other guy and betrayed him, he says, well, would you like some coffee? You know, you know, would you like me to make some coffee? I mean, the guy's too good to be true. But, so that's my, my, my solution to the whole thing is that learn different languages, you know, travel around the world, and you won't have to line up to become an audition to be a token. Okay, how long did that go? Okay. Anybody have any uh, questions right now? We, we got time for question and answers. One back there. Do you think uh, the current token is aware of the puppet strings connected to his shoulder? Oh, he's got to be aware. He's got to be aware. The magazine, The Atlantic, introduced the bell curve. They uh, and the hit and the and the. Uh, Publisher calls himself a neocon. And one of the senior editors is David Fromm, who coined the term axis of evil. That's why, Korea, that's why North Korea is, I mean, if you blame them, that's why North Korea is sending these missiles out. Because David Fromm, who's a senior editor at the Atlantic Monthly, wrote in a, a speech for George Bush, in which he referred to Iran, Iraq, and North Korea as the axis of evil. So the people in North Korea are not crazy. They saw what happened to Iraq, and so that's why they fired missiles. So this is a neocon magazine. These people are beyond Rubio. Rubio is a neocon candidate. You know, Edelson and the Koch brothers are pushing Rubio, but they can't stop this clown. There's nothing they can do with this clown. He says that he called, He said that uh, George Bush ought to be impeached. I never thought I'd see a day a Republican. You know. They can't stop him, but now the money is rolling behind Rubio to stop Trump because these guys want a war with Iran. And Atlantic Monthly is one of these places, so I'm sure he knows what's going on. You know, his thing was he turned into Bill Cosby. Now, I'm one of these guys who believes that due process. I don't think that people should be convicted on television or in the movies or, you know, in the New York Post or any of those places. So with the other, other problem with the token, he's got to turn in somebody. You know, they have to turn in somebody, just like Baldwin turned in Richard Wright. You know, these, these guys, they have to turn in people. So they all hang out at the New Yorker Magazine, the Nation Magazine, uh, the Atlantic Monthly, the New Republic. And now it's up for grabs because Gates has been exposed. Gates was H-I-H-N-I-C, -H right? Gates. But then he stumbled. He stumbled. And the people who made him that, you know, exalted him or anointed him, they're talking about his morals. You know? I said, you guys made him that, you're the ones who did that and made him, gave him that reputation in the first place. You know about the, uh, what's this guy's name, one of these movie actors told him to leave out the fact that his ancestor was a uh, Ben Affleck. And, he, and then he asked, he asked the head of Sony, because he doesn't know power, what should I do? He asked the head of Sony. And, uh, you know, uh, he, you know, some said we're trying to cover it up and everything. But WikiLeaks also exposed the fact that uh, WikiLeaks also exposed the fact that uh, uh, Gates tried to get an award for a guy named Harvey Weinstein, and uh, the head of Sony said we can't do that. Now, now he called. Now Gates went around. He became the head feminist, and the uh, black feminist said you're taking all the money. He was getting all the money. He was. He, uh, Michelle Wallace said he's taking all the money. He's, he, you can't be, he's doing all these things. You give us some of that money. So he had to dump everybody, call all of us misogynists and everything. But then he tried to get a, uh, an award for, talk about misogyny. First of all, he defended Clinton. He said, I'll go to the wall for President Clinton. And then they found out that he tried to get this guy an award and this Italian model said Harvey Weinstein took her to the hotel and he said, if you want to audition for a movie contract in the United States, you have to show me your breasts. 
this is a big time feminist, right? I mean, I hate to put that out there, but that's what happened. It's true. That's what happened. So, I mean, they're all kind of contradictions with this stuff. So now that he's down, all these guys are running for, you know, all these magazines, the New Republic, the Nation. I call them the Slave Patrol because they got to turn in, they got to turn in somebody in order to get credibility. But I mean, that's the mess that you have to deal with. But it's a big world. You don't have to just rely on. I mean, you know, I think that uh, African American opinion, Black opinion, is under occupation. Black opinion is under occupation. James Baldwin complained about his reviews for. Uh, Blues and Mr. Charlie. That's when he got in trouble with his sponsors. Blues and Mr. Charlie, which was done by the uh, actor studio. He didn't like the way they were treating his play. They said, okay, then we close the play. And Baldwin says, you're not gonna close my play. So he had all these people give him money, including the two Rockefeller sisters. Gave him $10,000 right there on the spot gave him $5,000 each. He offended them by continuing to play. So it wasn't long before Al Young and I uh, published a uh, magazine called Quilt. We got an exclusive interview with uh, Truman Capote, and he talked about how ball would have been done, done in. They rejected him. So that's gonna happen with this kid as soon as he does not carry out their orders. Same thing will happen to him. Well, Richard Wright was a little before my time, but I knew James Baldwin. And uh, this is a person who had a lot of style. He, he, he was like uh, an actor. I mean, he, every, every encounter I have, he, every time I saw him, it was like a performance. And he was able to hobnob with some of the richest and most famous people in the world. You know, I was, I was the token and waiting. I was a token and waiting. I was in some of the same columns and stuff like that that he was in. But instead, I, came, I went to Los Angeles. I didn't go to France, I went to Los Angeles. I said, I'm gonna go to the most barbaric place in the country. You say, somebody, why don't you go to Los Angeles? <laughs> you know. So I was broke, I didn't have any money. If I stayed there, I'd have been a token. When do, you, when do you recognize, uh, if you had to locate a particular moment when the, uh, the, the white power structure, I'll say, uh, decided you weren't gonna be a good token? <laughs> well, when I moved to the West Coast. Because the feeding ground, I mean, to these people in Manhattan, nothing happens west of the Rockies. And you can see that, uh, you know, the, the cultural leadership out here they take hand-me-downs from New York. You know, you look at that Berkeley rep, they, they usually wait for something to happen in New York, they bring it out here. So it's like a, a uh, you know, a inferior attitude. But uh, there's a culture, you know, west of the Rockies. Matter of fact, Chester Himes, who lived in my house in Oakland, I'm, I'm proud to say he lived in my house in Oakland for a summer. His novel, If He Hollers, has just been voted as the best Los Angeles novel. That's a killer novel. That's a killer novel. I mean, I'm reading Giovanni's room. I'm saying, I'm waiting for something to happen. Because it's all about these gay, these guys are, you know, some are gay, some are not. They're going from bar to bar in Paris and having oysters and drinking cognac. And I'm saying, I'm waiting for something to go. What's, wait a minute, what's going to happen here? You know? And here again, the uh, character, he knows his market. The lead character in the book is a blonde American man. He's a blonde, just like Vivaldi. This guy's Italian. I, and I was reading this, I think there's, somebody ought to write a paper on Italians and blacks. Because Italians, Italian characters repeatedly end up in novels by blacks. Like Amiri, Italians, you know? And uh, Sister Madate's Hell, you know? And, uh, and, and uh, Ryan, uh, uh, what's it? Uh, not not Lee what's that Chicago writer? Not knock on any door. Wait a minute. You know what I'm talking about. It'll come to me. Yeah, and not Adderley. What was his name? Not, not Roy Adderley, but there's a Chicago writer oh, who wrote about Italians. Yeah. But I mean, uh, uh, so, so the, 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 the lead character in 
another country is Italian Irish. And here again, he wants to rescue Leona, I mean, yeah, Leona for Rufus, but he makes terrible remarks about Italian American women, Catholic women. He says, there again, you know. Yes. Do I, do I figure? Who are the writers you admire most today? And do you consider yourself aligned with any kind of movement now in terms of like talk a lot about movements and um, oh, we got D. Scott here. I think I think uh, you talk about Afro futurism and so, so, Yeah, I think I think there are younger writers who are trying to tell a story in a different way. You know? Uh, and, they, and they're really following the musicians. And I'm studying music. You know, that, that was a challenge of pe people like Thelonious Monk and everything. It's how, how to tell the story in a different manner. You know, how to, how to use extensions, how to, you know, use some, like Victor Laval and uh, Col uh, Coastal Whitehead. And there's a whole, there's a whole avant-garde, Darius James, a whole avant-garde that they're not getting very much attention. But um, they're following the, six, the 60s, scared everybody. You know, Richard, Richard Nixon thought that the, Huey Newton was going to come in the White House and kill him. It scared everybody. I mean, seriously, they, they thought the Black Panthers, this, this, they thought this was like a massive movement with troops and battalions and everything, and they were afraid of the, of the Black Panthers. But the, 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 the 60s, like, abandoned this idea of imitating great masters. Uh, the 1940s generation, they were imitating great masters like Hemingway. You read their letters on Hemingway, Henry James, uh, Faulkner, uh, some others. But 1960s, there was a breakaway. So Baldwin appeals, especially in his essay, to people who share Judeo-Christian values. And you can tell from his titles, his themes, he uses uh, biblical metaphors a lot. But in the 1960s, inspired by Malcolm X and others, you had uh, black writers studying uh, Arabic, and changing the names. You know, some of us explored, some of us explored indigenous uh, folklore. Uh, so people went off, off in all kinds of different directions. And it was a rebellion against the so-called you know, literary master's imitation, okay? But then in the 1970s, with the rise of Reagan and those people, there was like what I call refried Faulkner, and all this stuff came back. So uh, that was a tension. They wanted to get rid of it. And, and now, you know what they're doing now, and I, I don't want to disparage it, I, you know, they're trying to Britishify the vernacular. Do you understand? So now they have these uh, African writers, and some of them write very well. But when I went to Africa, I found that uh, people like Sir Henkin and all of them went to schools where they're teaching 18th century English or something like that. So you got this old-timey style that you can see in the um, writers by African writers. And they're, they're like the flavor of the month. I mean, you, you go to book fairs in the east of Brooklyn and places, you don't have African-American writers, because you never know what they're going to do. Same thing as on faculties. You know, they, you know they, this guy said, we don't, want the, we don't want any black people here. They saw what they did at Berkeley. So they bring in people from the Caribbean. They bring in, you, you know how to work. You know how colonialism works? You know, like Sonny Apache, who's dictator of Nigeria, they brought him in from Chad. He's not even Nigerian. So they bring people, they br bring immigrants in, and, and, I'm, and I don't disparage this because, you know, a lot of them are good writers. But uh, Nguki is a great writer, but what did he do? He complained about racism in San Francisco. So you didn't hear about him very much. Nguki was at a hotel there in San Francisco, some fancy hotel. This is a, this is a writer who's lying to get the Nobel Prize for literature. And they took him for a homeless person or uh, for a bum or something like that. And they want to throw him out of his hotel. He says, you can't do that. So he complained about it, so you don't hear about him. So what they have are African writers, some of them come here, and they say, we love it here. That's how they do it. We, we're crazy about the United States. You know, what, what are these traditional African Americans complaining about? It's just like paradise. This woman says, I can go to the store, and I can find 30, 30 different types of soap. You know, it's not like home, you know, where you get the government soap or whatever, you know, but I can go there and we got variety here. You go to variety, we got variety here. You go to the Whole Foods and these places, I mean, you can get anything you want to get, anything you want. So they love it here. They can't, they can't understand why, 
you know, black people, you know, what's the problem? We're in a post-race period. We're in a post-race period. We got a black president. So, you know, what does everybody complain about? I think, it's, I think it's very, first of all, I think it's very important for so-called whites to get in touch with their background and their ancestry. And they'll find they weren't always white. This is a new, I call it nouveau, nouveau white, you know, because, for example, the Armenians in the Central Valley, they were called Orientals maybe 50 years ago. You know, the Irish were called Hibernians. I mean, Italians, the Italians had no idea of Italianists until they came to the United States. Matter of fact, uh, there was a differentiation between Sicilians, Northern Italians, and Southern Italians. There's a great book out called The Great Conspiracy about how Italian Americans identify with black people up until World War I. And, they, they, and what they do is the people give up their souls. This is what I'm going to say when I go to Italy is that they ought to send ambassadors over here so people recover their souls, you know, because there's no country, I've been all over here, there's no country called White Man or anything like that. So, and then the other thing is don't, don't rely on ambassadors to tell you how different communities, you know what I mean? Don't rely upon a token ambassador to tell you how those drums, what those drums mean. I saw Adolf Reed put it. Tell me what, tell me what those drums mean. You have to go out and explore it myself. I mean, I've been all over. I go to Native American, you know, Potlatch. I became, you know, honorary Clinton up there in Alaska. You know. I go to Irish American meetings, all these places I get invited to. I'm an ethnic gate crush. I want to learn about the mosaic that is the country. As a matter of fact, my new novel is based upon a critic at an Irish American meeting. Because uh, I was educated by a man named Bob Callahan. He's the guy that guided us in multiculturalism, late Bob Callahan. And he said, you know, the, Brit the British have been fighting the Irish for 800 years. And there was a celebration when Lord Mountbatten was killed. Lord Mountbatten, member of the British family, the royal family. So I, I, so I made that remark, and this Irish guy gets up, he said, well, we made up with them. You know, we made up with the British. And uh, we apologized for Lord Mountbatten. So I said, what about Lord Mountbatten's policies in India? And so I did some research, and I found that, uh, you know, he had a holocaust there that was done by the British. There were three million people, three million Indian peasants were killed because they were sending all the rice, they were sending all the rice to England during the war, and that's the same thing they did to Ireland. You know, potatoes are going to, to England. And I said, I looked up Lord Mountbatten, this is a terrible figure. This is an awful figure. And so my novel was inspired by that, going to this meeting. You know, and I talk about Churchill, and I talk about like how members of the subcontinent Indian community are being used against us. You know, you look at Bobby, uh, what's his name, Jindal, or you look at the governor of South Carolina. That's, that's all done to insult us. We're the black people are the next in line in South Carolina. If you want a governor, down in Louisiana, they almost selected a Klansman. They hate black soul. They almost selected David Duke. He ran for governor. He almost got elected, you know what I mean? So, you know, th this is a real problem of uh, people being used against each other. And that's the theme of my novel. But I did find out Lord Mountbatten's policies in Pakistan and India, you know. I mean, there's a great, I talk about gender against gender as partition. That's a great example of it. They divided Bangladesh, Pakistan, and India. Churchill said he didn't want all these people to get together, divide them. So, I mean, that's what happens when you go outside. You go to other places. And sometimes you get a good reception, and sometimes you know you get a hostile reception. Just curious, how much people come out and people inspire us here during the time, and vice versa? What's that again? How much do you think Fanon, 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 Fanon inspires here, and vice versa during that period of time? Are you talking about France Fanon? Yeah. 
Yeah, well, when I was in Martinique, uh, the people down there said, well, he should have had a revolution down here. You have to go to Paris. <laughs> I mean, that was French oppression down there. It still is. You look different between Guadeloupe and Martinique. Guadeloupe are, the people in Guadeloupe are very rebellious. But uh, this is French, it's still a French colony. So um, I don't know about Fanon, and I don't think violence is the answer. We got too much of that. Let's try something different. That's the way I, that's the way I look at it. I mean, I, I, get, I, I hear the news in the morning. I'm, I'm ashamed to be a man. I'm ashamed I belong, you know, I'm a male person. I'm killing people, raping people, bombing people, you know. All, I mean, that's what we get all day. So we got enough of that. Well, mumbo jumbo is a is a, an attempt to uh, explain the 1920s in terms of a dance epidemic. That's how it began. It then it led to other. I was reading something called the Putman Reader, the Putman Medieval Reader, where I found that there were these dance epidemics in uh, Europe, and I tried to apply that to I tried to apply that to the United States. It's a graphic novel, one of the first graphic novels. And my last novel, which was not covered here, about the OJ case, which is a taboo, you can't write about that. I illustrated that. I illustrated my cartoons called Juice. The title of the novel is Juice. And uh, there's going to be some coverage of it. ESPN is doing an OJ documentary in June, and they interviewed me about the novel. Because uh, no matter what you believe, there's still questions about that case. I, you know, I don't see that case as being closed. It's obvious the police planted evidence, but the people who are on television, and, I mean, he was convicted by television. The people on television haven't had, uh, people like uh, of the upper class males who dominate television uh, opinion, I don't, I haven't had an experience of police planting evidence. Now you had a, a black man in St. Louis shot in the back, and the cop planted evidence. They still, remember that you saw that, where he went over there and planted, put the gun next to, you know, they still don't believe it. But the police planted evidence in the uh, OJ case, and uh, Fox News, I think, I don't know if this series is still on, American Crime, by Jeffrey Tubin. Okay, Jeffrey Tubin believed that uh, blacks are intellectually inferior. He's saying that, uh, Blacks do not believe in evidence, or our blacks are not rational, but we shouldn't pat them on the head. He's a racist, this is a racist comment. Jeffrey Tubin on C uh, CNN, okay? But what he forgets about is that there was a Hispanic on the jury, too. Now you, they always call it a black jury. There was a Hispanic on the jury, and he said that he voted to acquit because the police planted evidence. Now you have three of the biggest forensics. I studied the case for 14 years. It took me 14 years to write the book. The police, uh, the three top forensics experts in the country, Henry Lee, Michael Baden, and Cyril West, all say there are problems with this case, with the police evidence. And even Cyril West, who believes that OJ is guilty, said the police planted evidence on that sock.